Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds Associates. Um, today is Thursday, March 31st, 2011. Um, in the last two days, the Fukushima plant has kind of been stable but precarious, kind of like balancing on the edge of a cliff but not going over and not being pulled back either. I wanted to um, give you my opinion of a couple of the more significant uh, pieces of information that have come out in the last two days. Uh, the, in, in broad terms, there's uh, very large amounts of liquids still being released to the environment, very large amounts of uh, gases still being released to the environment. And the other thing is that no one ever envisioned this type of recovery from an accident um, even a month ago before Fukushima happened. Well, let's talk about the liquid and gases uh, releases. The, uh, the, the New York Times is reporting that uh, 200 tons of radioactive liquid are being poured into the nuclear reactors and the fuel pool at Fukushima every day. Well, where's it going? If it's going in, it's coming out. And it's coming out two ways. It's coming out as radioactive steam and it's coming out as radioactive water. So if you're putting 200 tons in, 200 tons is coming out. In engineering terms, that's called feed and bleed. And what you're feeding in as clean water is bleeding out as radioactive steam and radioactive water. Well, there's some indications off-site that the uh, releases are very large. The fuel's clearly damaged, significantly damaged, and of course the releases are gonna be large with 200 tons of, of uh, releases every day. That boils down to a couple things. The IAEA, that's the International Atomic Energy Agency, has found that um, 25 miles away from the reactor, there's been deposition of radioactive material to the tune of 2 million becquerels per square meter. Now what does that mean? A square meter is about three feet by three feet, uh, meter by a meter, and uh, two megabecquerels is two million disintegrations every second is being deposited in roughly three feet by three feet. Now, that's well above what the IAEA would say you should evacuate <coughs> if the levels are that high. So there are, there are places out well beyond where the uh, Japanese are evacuating that should be evacuated based on the deposition of radioactive materials nearby. To give you a, a, an example, at Chernobyl, the exclusion zone was 500,000 becquerels. This is four times higher than Chernobyl. Now there are different isotopes and some of these will decay away and the Chernobyl ones are longer lived, but these are, are very serious concentrations of radioactivity being deposited on the ground from the radioactive steam coming out of the plant. The next thing is the water. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, incredibly high concentrations in the radioactive water in trenches on site. Um, there's indications that the survey meters simply can't rate, read high enough to measure the amount of radiation coming off the water. But and another indication is what's in the ocean. Uh, offshore radioactive readings in the ocean have gone up and they're now over 3,000 3, times higher than the standards that are uh, routinely expected. That's not coming from the air. The ocean's too big to be, um, to be polluted by, by what's coming out of the airborne releases. It's clearly leaking from the trenches into the ocean. They haven't found the leak, but um, it, the only source of, of quantities of radioactive material uh, large enough to pollute the ocean has got to be leakage from these trenches. So with 200 tons of liquid going in and 200 tons of liquid going out, it's reasonable to expect that the, uh, the ocean is going to be polluted because uh, um, it's, it's clearly leaking in. Now, there's one other interesting reading that was detected on site. There are several what's called heavy elements that are being detected on the ground. Uh, we talked about plutonium in the last video, um, but there are some other ones too, something called cerium, which is also one of these that doesn't easily go volatile. And that it's on the ground also indicates um, significant fuel damage, most likely from the fuel pool in unit, uh, unit four. 
Well, it's important to realize that this feed and bleed operation that's going on was never anticipated a, a, a month ago by anyone who ever planned to mitigate an accident. A month ago, the worst accident that was ever assumed was 1% of the fuel in one reactor melted. We've got 70% of the fuel in three reactors melting. A month ago, we thought the containment would leak at half a percent per day. Um, now we know the containment is leaking much more than, than half a percent per day. And a month ago, we thought that the, um, th that the radioactivity would go high up a stack, and in fact, we're finding that the stacks don't work and the radiation's on the ground. The net effect of this is that in the Fukushima vicinity, exposures are probably 500 to 1,000 times higher than anticipated in the accident analysis that was, you know, that was reasonable um, a month ago. Also, a month ago, no one ever envisioned the possibility of a fuel pool burning. That's still a possibility. Um, Brookhaven National Labs, back in 1997, did a survey, did a study that said that the um, consequences of a fuel pool burning would be 137,000 fatalities from lung cancer. That's a serious um, study, and it's a number that we still need to be concerned about. Now, the difference between what, what's, what's happened and what we thought would happen is that everyone believed that the containment would contain, and it's not. The plan was that what was in the reactor would get recirculated in the reactor, and none of that material would come out into the groundwater. And so these exposures are much, much higher as a result of what's happened to Fukushima. Well, thank you very much, and I'll uh, get back to you as more develops.